Okay, so uh, next up uh, we have an old coworker of mine, uh, which fun, uh, her fun fact is uh, she speaks four languages and she has at least one name per language. So you might know her as uh, JBD from Twitter, Raquel from GitHub, or also Jana or Yana or Hana if you're cool, or, <laughs> or Buju. Or, yeah, so uh, just like, yeah, come up. Uh, she's going to be talking about tracing, but not really. So, round of applause for Jana. Uh. Hi there. Uh, good morning. Actually, it's almost afternoon. He didn't really talk about my surname. My surname also is being pronounced like three different ways, and that really adds to the complexity. So um, I really like to talk about systems, but and I was invited to give a keynote um, just a week ago at another conference, and I was in New York. So I was, you know, New York is this huge, big city, and it's so influential that it really changed the way I think about a systems issue. And today I want to give, you know, talk about that. So I love big cities because I lived mainly in big cities all through my life until San Francisco. Uh, some people think that. You know, I can actually tolerate large companies because I love big cities and I'm a big city person. Uh, we're in San Francisco, but unfortunately, I will, I'm going to talk about a big city, New York today. So, <laughs> big city people like to deal with, you know, the scale and maybe the misery of being so insignificant uh, since the early ages. We also learn, you know, how to find our ways around, how to deal with, you know, the like large city. Um, and if the reason for this, for example, if you live in New York City, you only care for a few parts of the city, not the entire thing. You just care about your neighborhood, some of the other neighborhoods, and then you know some some interesting parts of the city. Uh, and you know, even if you're not from a large city, you can relate to this. Every time you visit a large city, you are probably only care about visiting a few parts. Uh, for example, some people like to do touristy things, uh, walking from Central Park to the Times Square. So your experience of the city is pretty limited to what you choose to engage with. And um, you know, it's not always good. Like things may go wrong along the way. There's some road construction. There's lots of traffic, pedestrian traffic, especially in this road. So things uh, may get frustrated. Um, and systems are pretty much like our cities. Our users really engage with a small piece and uh, they don't necessarily know about the entire stack, and their uh, entire opinion about your system is very limited to that particular experience. You know, if, you, if, you, if your background service is, pro, for example, a little bit delayed or crashing more often, they might not be able to recognize it, but if you respond slightly delay on the critical path, on, on, on their you know, experience, uh, they will be able to tell. So we think that we are really, we kind of understand how to deal with large systems in terms of both development, production, and maintenance. But um, I, I'm actually, you know, I work for so many small and large companies, from very extreme small to extreme large, and I never thought that we are, we are doing a great job in this. Um, at my current company, I sort of think that we are doing a better job, but I think that there are lots of gaps here and there, and my team is specifically working on to fill those gaps. So by the way, I'm Jana, like I go with Jana nowadays, and uh, I've been you know, working at Google for a while. I have this uh, interesting experience uh, of being able to touch to many different things in the stack, both in technical infrastructure and the, you know, the product side of the things. So I, I think I have a good you know, idea how this company works. And I have several stories about my company. This is one of the uh, most interesting stories. So the early days of a company or a project is our favorite, right? Like it's like super minimal, things are very simple. You often have a single server and a few other components maybe. Where's your data? It's usually, you know, you have some Postgres cluster somewhere. Um, you are dependent on few vendor services for very primitive stuff like SMS or email. Um, you are probably on a cloud provider, but you are interacting with them very, you know, very little. Um, your architecture at this point is still fitting into your brain. And you know, it's just like a few notes here and there, basically. Uh, you check the logs, maybe, when things go wrong. Um, everything still scales. And when somebody joins to the team, you just go and you know, take them to the whiteboard and explain everything in 10 minutes, maybe. Um, the next step, we have more engineers because you know, the company is growing if, it's, if your business is legit. And <laughs> I hope that your business is legit. 
the, the number of you know, reusable components are increasing and you, know, you start to see uh, the, the, the company has lots of different clusters, clusters of people now, we sometimes call them sub-teams. And uh, the, there's like some certain divergence in terms of culture. Uh, some people want to go to production more often. Some people don't want to deploy that much. So at, some, at this point, you started to see lots of conflicts between teams. And this is where you begin to realize that, hey, our monoliths don't scale. We need to do something better. And this is the typical story. We either you know, have been through this or read about it. This is where microsystems come around. And things start to look more of like this. You have some services, you have different storage systems, you have like some you know, more external services you depend on. The growth is great, really, especially like from a VC's perspective, I, I, I think. <laughs> but from an engineering perspective, it complicates a lot of things. Uh, one problem become many, and you, know, you cannot really depend on earlier way of doing things. And, uh, for example, I mentioned logs specifically, and it just becomes so much harder to read the logs and debug things by looking at the logs. Uh, things fail in isolation. It's always harder to you know, reason about the root cause of the problems. And your engineers don't necessarily you know, understand where things fail and what to do and who to ping. So it goes larger. It's some, like some organizations really operate at a level that who has time to understand anything at that company end to end, right? Uh, some people may say that like people like Jeff Dean because they've been around for a long time and have advantage to you know understand everything because they've been the people who designed some of this stuff in the first place. Uh, and some people think that like hey this is how you get to the principal level from seniors. So like that's like a reg you know every organization pretty much have this type of people. But is this really how we work, especially at a very large scale? Uh, are we you know pinging these individuals uh, every second? I think um, that's not the case because you know Jeff Dean just went and like working on something else right now, and my company is still working. So to be rea more realistic, <laughs> and my company things are looking a little bit like mess, like this. So this looks like a pain. Uh, to be honest, when I see this, this is the reality of Google, and I don't want to work at this company because it's such a big mess. Um, at some point, you know, this is this is the meme. I see it every day, delete all the code, you know, rewrite stuff, and you know, let's minimize. Because at some point you wanna you know, stop and consider what you've been doing. Uh, we have this complexity, so many lines of code owned by all these different teams, and you know, what is next? Like, nobody understands how this works end to end. And people who have been around for a long time start to actually leave the company because they are being the, you know, the source of truth, and it's becoming frustrating uh, to be a part of the conversation every day. Um, and you know, we also think that like, hey, documentation may fix some of these problems, but documentation unfortunately never scales. People just don't like the document, and documentation can be a little bit dangerous because they are always outdated. I often tell this to everybody, and I will tell it again, I think. Uh, if you know, engineers were paid based on how they document their work, they would still not document it. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> when I first joined the company, on my first hour, they showed me this. This is just a mock. Uh, it's like a search bar. You just type in whatever you want, and it searches all our source code. This is basically a Google for Google source code, and you know it's 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 an amazing tool. It's just very powerful, and but you know it only works if you have an entry point, some sort of like a text symbol, project name, username. Um, if you don't, you know, good luck. And you know I use search every day at Google, but this is just like the part of it. And the second I think interesting thing we have is this unified build tool. So this allows us to see all the you know dependency graphs from Blaze. Blaze is our uh, internal tool that inspired Bazel. Uh, we have this unified tool so we can, you know, just click on a build target and, you know, you can see what you're dependent on or who's dependent on you. It's, again, great, but it's part of the story. Also, static analysis tools are, you know, nice and can tell you about your code dependencies, but what about your service dependencies? As I said, that we're not monoliths anymore, so we really care about our service dependencies. Um, your manifest files, de deployment manifest files, can tell a little bit more, but Nobody likes those files. Like there are very few people who understand those files, and you can relate to this because Kubernetes manifest is just like such a huge mess. Like nobody wants to you know, write tooling against it. And I think more importantly, none of these tools are good in pointing out uh, what critical paths and what dependencies require the most attention. So this is how things look like in the wild world, but the 
The blue line here is what a critical path looks like. Uh, the user request comes to the load balancer, goes through several servers, and then like all the way to the low-level disks. And at my company, you know, engineers can see all these critical paths from you know, user-facing things or any server, pretty much. And this ability is the reason, one of the reasons why it's possible to you know, learn and debug our systems. So I've been thinking for a while that this way of thinking really requires this paradigm, um, and I want to call it CPDD, which is a very mouthful name. Uh, but the, the goal here is, it, it means critical path-driven development. Uh, the, the, the goal here, the availability of the servers, the underlying stuff, doesn't matter too much from a user perspective. The availability and the experience of the critical paths are, like the New York example, I care about walking from you know, Times Square to Central Park. So being able to see uh, our systems and you know, uh, debug them from this perspective is, is an incredibly different approach, but it's also very useful in our experience. Some of our engineering practices are really based around discovering these critical paths and then you know, making them reliable, then making them fast, uh, making them also debuggable in production. If you, you are on call and uh, you, you, received a, you, know, you received something, uh, you just want to be able to see everything end to end, even if you are not familiar with the entire stack. And it's almost impossible to be you know, familiar with the entire stack because it has so many components and so many teams, uh, so many services from different teams involved. Um, so, cool, how we get there? Um, I, I would say that there are two emerging technologies in the industry nowadays. You usually hear them in the context of observability. Uh, we, uh, the first one is the event collection, and the second one is distributed tracing. I want to say that we use uh, distributed tracing at Google, but these technologies are very similar things. Um, do, do you know the golden rule of exploring cause effect relationships? You know, it's just the ability to keep asking why. You just ask, you know, why this happened? And then you ask why that happened, and then keep going and asking, and you finally understand the root cause. So distributed tracing or event collection are like this. Like, it's the ability to ask why and go in deeper in the stack and understand the root causes. So a while ago, we started an instrumentation uh, library project uh, just because we wanted to you know, collect some, produce some data, and we want to satisfy some of the high-level goals I explained. Uh, it's a library that works with major open source you know, uh, tools and some of the proprietary tools. Uh, it collects some data and you know, pushes your tools. This is one of the example tools. Like uh, This is from Google Cloud Trace, but there are lots of you know, other open source uh, projects like Zipkin and Jaeger. Uh, and this is what a distributed trace looks like, if you haven't seen anything like th this before. It's a trace for an HTTP GET. It tells you the latency and the exact components along the way. So you can take a look at these rods and learn about the life of a request. Uh, you can see that, uh, you know, the, you can also use the data coming from production to diagnose issues that is affecting our users. You can see, you know, all the servers involved and all the, like, uh, typical endpoints uh, that has been invoked. So first of all, this is a teaching tool. Uh, you don't have to learn about implementation details of everything because you know we, 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 our stack is getting larger every year. We used to you know, have a lot of problem with kernel, not understanding kernel. Kernel now provides some tools. Maybe you know, it's a little bit easier, but m most of the time we don't care about kernel. We're still trying to understand a network stack. It's such a huge stack. But now the cloud stack is also like getting larger. Like Kubernetes, nobody really understands what is going on internally. Um, and you may have a better understanding maybe what is going on inside your process, but some frameworks are really fat and uh, it's also hard to understand what is the internals. So um, we may have a little bit more control over our user process and what goes in it, but everything underneath it is a black box for most of us. So if your infra was providing some sort of visibility from these low level layers, it really, you know, changes the way we do things. Rather than learning everything, we can just you know, rely on traces coming from these lower stacks. Think about this as an S-trace for network and cloud stack, uh, to be honest, and including your own stack. Uh, imagine Kubernetes was able to provide you some significant events in the lifetime of a request, so you don't have to learn, go and learn Kubernetes internals. You can take a look at your trace and understand and reason. Um, and more than a learning tool, this is a cross-stack you know, debugging tool. You can blame to see whether it's your fault or someone else's fault. For example, 
I'm uh, on a cloud provider, and uh, this this trace is coming from some cloud provider. Some of the some of the spans here, uh, the first two is coming from my cloud provider, and it looks like we have spent some time, some more additional time on the scheduler and the load balancer, and I can easily tell that hey, this is not this doesn't belong to me. I can call the cloud provider SRE and escalate the issue to them, and I can send them the trace and have some evidence. Uh, traces and events are really cool, but I would say that like this is just the beginning. This is like really the most essential thing to build some stuff on top of you know what I'm trying to explain. Uh, the next step is can you tell you know what what source code this span represents? So uh, there's a production issue, for example. You want to be able to see the handler. Uh, and you just maybe want to click on that and like see the source code, so you can finally analyze and see what is going on. And um, if you if you can you know find uh, the resolution, you can commit some changes and push a new version to the prod. Or if you do not understand what is going on there, so uh, the next step is you know who to call, who to ping, who to page when there's something wrong. It could be a latency issue, it could be an error. Um, who to call? I imagine that at some point, like we will be able to you know click on this and see the you know the primary on-call person, and uh, you know there is no need to you know do the guesswork or do the you know the huge debugging who owns this handler. Uh, we should do a better job integrating our trace tools uh, with some of the existing concepts we have for incident response. And uh, the next step is give me all the additional data we have. So distributed tracing is just part of it, even though we sometimes think that this is the ultimate tool. Uh, it's just the big, you know, it's just one of the signals we have. Uh, you want to get some, you want to get the logs, uh, runtime or kernel events if you have any. Uh, you want to be able to get some of the you know, profiles or some of the you know, execution tracer data to understand what is going on. So you can really go and dig and see why you are seeing latency here. We worked on um, a, comp this is, there's a standard library component uh, for the HTTP stack, HTTP trace. And if you have seen this blog post, on HTTP tracing, it was basically explaining you how you can hook into significant events in the life of an outgoing HTTP request. So the Go standard library have this capability, and you know putting that in the standard library is one cool thing, but hooking it to the instrumentation libraries is just another one. For example, our instrumentation library can hook those events, so you can in the lifetime of a distributed trace span, you can see all these like low-level networking events. Here you can see um, that there is a DNS that has been made, uh, and it took a while because it's always DNS that takes time, and then um, you know DNS is done, and you know we also collect some of the additional metadata. You can see the uh, the IP that it resolved and everything. So you, if, if there's an incident, you can easily tell like what level of low-level networking stack issue was involved in this problem. Similarly, we have some integrations with execution tracers. So now the Go execution tracer can associate your code with the runtime events. And if you have a latency issue, you can easily tell, hey, if this is a GC issue or a scheduler issue or like an IO blocking, uh, some, some IO related issue, uh, you have more tools to be able to tell. In process diagnostics and debugging is one of the other things that we like uh, because they are useful if your instrumentation library fails to export data. You can always you know, take a look at your in-process. This is an in-process dashboard we provide from every server and it uh, reports you about the spans collected in this particular process. So you can see the, you know, the latency and the error and it's useful to debug cases where you know, instrumentation fails to export data. You can just take a look, hey, where it fails, what is going on. And you can use this to debug the instrumentation itself. Um, I know that this is a lot to digest, but I'm giving you some pointers so you can actually see you know, what you can do with this type of data. And if you only have like two or three cases that I explained that might be useful for you, maybe you can consider these tools. Uh, nothing comes free, of course, and I want to explain some of the everyday challenges first because you shouldn't undermine the level of investment required to roll up these technologies at your organization. The first challenge, if you need critical path analysis, it becomes such a cross-team issue. It's an organizational issue. The entire organization need to agree on some of the basic primitive stuff. 
So in order to have end-to-end -end traces or events, you need to align on the identifiers. Uh, how, how are we going to propagate the identifiers around? You know, the tracing backend just dis uh, displays a tree, and you should be able to reconstruct that tree, so you need to you know, pass some identifiers around. Your load balancers, proxies, your CDN should be able to understand and honor this format. It's very unfortunate that as an industry, we don't have anything, any, any sort of standard for this problem yet. And this keeps being a barrier for lots of teams who want to introduce these technologies. I've talked to lots of companies who are like 100 people, and it took them like, you know, six months, six months of, you know, debates in terms of like, this is how we propagate the identifiers. No, 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 like that's, that's not the way around. So I think this is a main huge issue, but the good news is there's an upcoming proposal to W3C. It's still a draft, it still needs time, but I think that it might unify a few things. And this is only for HTTP right now, but I do believe that it, it's going to influence other transports. And um, there's still huge amount of work here, but I'm really optimistic about the future now. Um, the second challenge is most people don't know where to begin. We usually say to them like, hey, start with your network stack, specifically HTTP and gRPC. This is where things get you know, easy if you have some sort of like frameworks, uh, unified frameworks at your company, or if you have little fragmentation in terms of frameworks. What you can do is to instrument the frameworks, or you can use the existing you know, framework integrations uh, that uses an instrumentation library and like gather this type of data. The other challenge is we infrastructure builders or vendor services do not care about the observability aspects uh, of the stack. And uh, we still expect people to learn about our stuff by reading the manual. Uh, I think this is not scaling and like we want to do better in terms of providing out of the box traces maybe. So we should you know, give you some visibility along the request as providers rather than expecting you to call us or like learn about our internals. Instrumentation is expensive, so high traffic uh, services really cannot end up always being, uh, end up downsampling and cannot 100% rely on these tools because it's very expensive. So we sometimes need, you know, we still need to depend on uh, metric collection and aggregation in process to make this a little bit cheaper. Uh, and we sometimes miss collecting data for interesting cases such as 99 percentile latency issues because it's very expensive and you know, our downsampling is very probabilistic. This is an issue that we, th this is like so much technical details, but we need to do a better job here. Uh, the other challenge is we used to think about instrumentation as a very static thing and you know, for a long time in this industry that we design, hey, this is what we should collect, and in production you cannot touch it, it's just there, you can just collect and see the data. Um, in our experience, dynamic capabilities are extremely important. Ideally, we want to be able to you know, tweak things in production, enable more collection, get, get that data, you know, take a look and maybe disable collection because it's expensive. And you know, being able to do this and doing it in a safe way in production is not at the reach of a lot of people. The other challenge is, uh, I mentioned correlation with different you know, signals such as logs, execution tracer data, maybe, maybe profiles. Uh, without a unified identification format, this is kind of like tough, so I do think that like, the standards uh, proposal is also going to help us. We will have a unified ID everywhere, so all these frameworks, like logging frameworks, can honor the IDs and you know, can automatically associate uh, the signals. So we're still in the dark ages. Um, I, I feel like you know, I'm the snake oil salesman person here. <laughs> When I talk about these concepts, you know, I just feel kind of ashamed, like, hey, what am I, I'm talking about something so idealistic, doesn't really match with the reality. But I, at the same time, I want to explain that, you know, this is a reality for lots of people. Uh, you know, these are the tools that we use every day. And being able, you know, having this ability to, have, being able to have this type of visibility into your systems, it's, it's great in terms of maintaining your production and, you know, uh, scaling your development, but it's also from the perspective of regular engineers, it's such an amazing tool. You can just hire someone and they can learn about your entire stack without really relying on other individuals. I really see this tool as a, as a tool that closes the knowledge gaps more than anything else in our industry, but you know, we don't talk about it. So, you know, I explain the story every time I, uh, someone new uh, joins to my company. Or if I go to, you know, and talk to other teams at other companies. And I want to come here and, you know, talk about it as well. So if you're building infrastructure or you're building, you know, providing infrastructure, we should also collaborate because uh, we should 
be able to you know, improve the status quo, we really need to you know, close the knowledge gaps by providing more visibility. Thanks so much for having me here.